now time to thank the speaker with a good friend uh, christoph so christoph uh, is, did his phd from ecole normale superior in uh, paris with stefan forb uh, whom also uh, i know him he's a good friend and uh, after that uh, he did several post docs in princeton university woodzol and after that uh, he moved back to ecole normale uh, as a professor so uh, he works in uh, very interesting experiments i mean their lab is very fascinating and he will talk about one of his experiments more recent ones on angular momentum transport in astrophysics uh, okay christoph uh, please take over thank you very much uh, so hello everyone uh, thank you for the invitation i'm very happy to to discuss this uh, this work with you today so um, on this slide i uh, put the people i've been i working with on this project. So for the experiment I will describe in this talk, I work with Michael Pereira, Stefan Fauve, and Marlon Vernet. So Marlon is a PhD student working currently on the experiment. So most of the results I will show today are uh, have been obtained by, by, uh, by Marlon. And on the numerical side, you will see that the end of my talk is uh, dealt with some global numerical simulation. And this simulation has been done, we have been done with uh, Ludovic petit de Mange and Florence Marcotte. Okay, so before I, um, before I switch to the uh, astrophysical motivation of this uh, work, I want to highlight what motivates me as a physicist. So to do that, I think the uh, best way to do that is to start with a very simple example, which is Rayleigh-Bénard convection, thermal convection. So I guess you all know this, uh, this setup. So you have a fluid, which is confined between two plates, a hot plate at the bottom and cold plate at the, at the top boundaries. And so there is a thermal gradient uh, between the two plates. If the thermal gradient is large enough, there is then thermal convection, it's an instability. So you have motions of the fluids which will increase the transport of heat across the two plates, okay? Now, if you want to, um, if you want to quantify the transport of heat, you can define the flux of temperature, so the flux crossing the uh, horizontal plane, which is the uh, dashed line here. So this is the flux of temperature, or the heat flux, which has two contributions. One contribution, so the bracket means that uh, I am averaging over this horizontal plane. So the first component involves the velocity here. So it's the advection of the temperature by the velocity field. And there is always some molecular uh, term here, which involves the thermal diffusivity. And which of course, because you have a, a real fluid, there is always some transport, which is due to molecular diffusion. Okay. Now you all know this problem. What I will be discussing today is a different problem, a slightly different problem, which is the transport of angular momentum in rotational flows. So the classical setup for this problem is like that. You have in general two concentric cylinders, one inner cylinder which rotates faster than the outer cylinder by uh, some factor delta omega. And in fact, it is known that in some limits, for example, in, uh, for small gap between those two cylinders, these two problems are completely equivalent in the sense that the governing equation for thermal convection becomes identical to the governing equation for rotational flows. Okay, so that's basically the same problem. The heat is replaced by angular momentum in this problem and the temperature field is replaced by the angular uh, rotation omega of the fluid. The r is just the, the distance to the axis. So you have a very similar problem. There is a rotational flows. If the flow is turbulent, there is a transport of angular momentum from the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder. So you can quantify again this transport by measuring some flux. So now it is a flux of angular momentum crossing any cylindrical surface between the two cylinders. And you can define it the same way than before. There is one term which involves the velocity. So the transport of angular momentum by velocity. And again, there is some molecular diffusion. So in this case, it is the viscosity, the kinematic viscosity, which will uh, diffuse the angular momentum and produce some transport, okay? So when you look at this problem, there is a very general question, uh, quite hard to answer. 
which is to understand and to predict, in this case, how the angular momentum flux, J, J, depends on the difference of speed between the two cylinders, or for example, how it depends on the kinematic viscosity. Okay, it's, um, so that's basically my motivation here as a physicist, to see if we can get some uh, nice answers, some nice uh, scaling laws for the transport of angular momentum. So it's a problem very similar to people looking for the heat flux uh, in Rayleigh Benard. Okay, now there is also a very strong astrophysical motivation. So as you may know, the turbulence is quite ubiquitous in astrophysics. Almost any astrophysical object we look at is turbulent. But surprisingly, it's quite tricky to explain the origin of this turbulence. The, the scenario which leads these, these or these obje objects to become turbulent. So I'll give you here two examples. The first example is accretion disk. The accretion disk are these huge structures of gas, very thin disk, which orbits, um, which orbit around a central object. It can be a protostar, for example, or a black hole. And so you have this rotational flow like that. And we know that from observations that there is a huge accretion rate. So in addition to the rotational flow, there is also a lot of inward uh, falling matter on the, on the protostar, on the black hole at the center. Which means that if you have accretion of objects, it means that you have some outward transport of angular momentum. So the angular momentum in these objects is uh, in the gas here is very efficiently transported from the inner part of the disk to the outer part. Of course, turbulence can do the job very, very efficiently. But as you will see, I will discuss that a little bit later. But as you will see, these Keplerian rotation, which are typical of accretion disk, are stable, they're linearly stable. So it's not very easy to find a nice scenario to make this guy turbulent. So it's a problem for doing prediction for the angular momentum transport. There is a second example, which is almost the same problem, in fact, which are radiative stars. So I, when I say radiatives, I mean the radiative region of the stars. You, so I'm not interested in the region of the star which is convecting when you have thermal convection, but rather the other region, which is in general present in any stars, when you have the heat which is transported by radiation, so it's or conduction, so it's a radiative uh, regions. In these regions, we have a similar problem. If you look at the rotation profile from the center of the star to the outer parts, it's very flat. So you have a very flat rotation profile which is surprising because you would expect some differential rotation. So again, it means that there is some mechanism which transports the angular momentum in the star and flattens the rotation curve. But again, the turbulence uh, might do the job, but it's hard to find where this turbulence is coming from because radiative zone, in contrast with convec convection zone, they are stably stratified. There is a very strong uh, density stratification which prevents any instability, any uh, complex motion in the, in the star. So you need to find a way to become turbulence before you can explain the transport of angular moment. So that's basically the astrophysical motivation here. So my talk uh, will be divided between two parts. In the first part, I will describe so a new liquid metal laboratory experiment, uh, which aims at, model, at modeling uh, an accretion disk in the laboratory. So again, in this case, this will not be an MRI experiment for those of you who know these problems so in the sense that I will not investigate where the turbulence is coming from in these objects. Okay. Here, I just want to have an experiment which mimics several properties of the accretion disk. So I can study how the angular momentum is transported by turbulence in this disk. So I can make prediction for the accretion rates. And as you will see, it's also a uh, a section where I will discuss some theoretical uh, issues about uh, transporting angular momentum with turbulence. And in a second part, which is almost independent of the first one, but in fact related by the same problem, I will describe global numerical simulation of radiative stars. And in this case, in contrast with the first part, I will try to uh, describe a scenario to explain where the turbulence is coming from. And so again, we will try to characterize the transport of angular momentum to explain the spinning down of radiative stars. So I hope it is clear for my outline. Um, 
So let's start with the first part. So when it comes to model an accretion disk in laboratory, uh, people have been mostly using, be using Taylor Quet flows, which makes sense. It's a very simple but complex uh, system. So again, these two concentric cylinders, it contains a fluid between them. So you can impose some differential rotation between the two cylinders. And so I won't review uh, all the results that have been obtained with Taylor Quet flows. There is a lot of results, very interesting. I will just say that you can roughly divide these studies in two different parts. So there is one type of studies in which people have been using Taylor Quet flows to investigate where the turbulence is coming from. So if this is, for example, the group in Princeton or in Dresden. So in this case, you set up a laminar flow with your Taylor Quet system, and then you try to make it turbulent similarly to what's happening in accretion disk. There is a second type of studies, which is closer to what I will present today, where you don't care too much about that. The idea is to set up a flow as turbulent as possible, and then to study how the turbulence transport the angular momentum to make some prediction or some understanding of these objects. So there is very fundamental and interesting results on both parts of these studies. But for today, I would like to highlight the limitations uh, that appears when you want to use a Taylor Quet flow. The first obvious one is the rotation rate. As you know, or as you probably know, accretion disks like that, they are due to a force balance between the centrifugal force and the gravitational, the gravitation. So if you do this force balance here, you get a velocity profile, which is called a Keplerian rotation rate, which means that the velocity is scaled like one over square root of the radius of the distance to the axis. It's an interesting profile because it's linearly stable, as I mentioned earlier, which means that you don't know exactly how it becomes turbulent, but observations indicate some turbulence in this disk. So there is some puzzle, interesting puzzle here. When you do that with a quet profile, it's different. As you can see, the velocity in a Taylor quet flow is quite different from the Keplerian rotation rate. So in this case, you can never really reproduce a Keplerian rotation rate. You can play with the rotation of the cylinders to mimic, to get as close as possible to a Keplerian flow. This is called quasi-Keplerian flows. But in this case, the flow is not really turbulent. So you have to choose between having a profile which is close to an accretion disk, but not turbulent, or having something turbulent but not really close to an accretion, uh, to a Keplerian rotation. So that's the first obvious problem. The second problem is that in Taylor Quet flow, the cylinder are rotating, which means that the angular momentum, and so the rotation, is injected at the boundaries of the setup. It's a problem, as you will see later in the talk, because then your angular momentum has to diffuse from these boundaries to the bulk flow, and it completely dominates the dynamics of the angular momentum. This does not happen in an accretion disk. There is no real boundaries. Um, and so there is, you could say that the gravitation is injecting in volume the angular momentum. So it's a different problem. And the last problem, it's again due to the boundaries. Uh, Taylor quite set up of, of some finite sizes. So there is some end caps at the top and bottom, which generally drive some recirculation. So in addition to the quet flow, you also have some recirculation. And this recirculation is a problem because it can transport locally the angular momentum. It can destabilize the flow and so on. And again, it does not exist in accretion disk where the boundaries are almost absent. There is stress-free boundary conditions. It's a very large object. So in general, we can drop any consideration um, attached to the boundaries. So for all these reasons, I'm what I'm trying to do here is to convince you that we need a different setup to model an accretion disk, which is, of course, the, uh, the experiment I will uh, present today. So this is the Kepler experiment that we've been working on for the last two years. So it's a very thin disk. It's one centimeter in height and 40 centimeter in diameter. So it's a very, very thin disk, which is which have a fluid, which is a liquid metal, which is confined between two concentric cylinders, like in Taylor Quet systems. This is a picture of the experiment. So as you can see, there is an inner cylinder, an outer cylinder here. And of course, we don't want to rotate these boundaries. So these boundaries are not rotating. So to drive the flow, what we do is that we put a liquid metal in the space here, 
and we inject some electrical currents. There is some uh, radial current going from these electrodes to the inner cylinder here. And then we place this disk in between two magnetic coils, which generate a vertical magnetic field. So you have a Laplace force, a Lorentz force, which acts on the liquid metal, J cross B, which gives you an azimuthal Lorentz force in the azimuthal direction. Okay, so you can see here on this movie that there is a few amps going through the electrode, and you're driving the flow in this azimuthal direction. Okay, so. This is not really an MHD experiment in the sense that I'm only using a liquid metals because the Lorentz force produces a very homogeneous and interesting forcing for the flow. So you can really think of this experiment as a classical hydrodynamic experiment, but with this volumic forcing uh, on it. So uh, we are using liquid gallium. There are some details here. There is two important characteristics on these experiments. Um, which makes some difference with previous uh, experiments on this topic. The first one is that we are using a very thin disk. It's of course to get something closer to an accretion disk, but as you will see, that's not the only reason. There is a, a fundamental reason to get a thin disk. So that's a very important characteristic. And the other character characteristic is that the current we are injecting is very large. We are injecting 3000 amps across the liquid metal. Again, there is some reason for that that will become clear in a minute. So these are the two characteristic prime uh, characteristics of the, of the experiments. And we can do several measurements. So you can see here some probes in the experiment. We can measure um, the radial and the azimuthal velocity uh, along the radius, for example, from uh, ultrasonic Doppler velocimetry. We also have access to other things like pressure fluctuations or induced magnetic fields. Okay, so this is the experiment. Now, so I won't detail all the results uh, we got with this, uh, with this experiment. So they are reported in this paper here. I just want to discuss what is important for the angular momentum transport today. So here's the mean velocity, time averaged, measured in the middle of the disk, somewhere at mid height. It is plotted as a function of the forcing, which is the current I times the magnetic field B. And as you can see by this number here, we, are, we can reach several meters per second. So it's a very efficient driving. We can, at full current, we can drive a very turbulent flow. The second important point, probably one of the most important points of this experiment, is that at large forcing, we get an exact Keplerian rotation rate, similarly to what happened in accretion disk. Okay, so it's a big difference with Taylor Quet flows. You can see here the square of the measurements, and it is very well fit with the angular rotation as a function of the radius, and it is very well fit by some Keplerian rotation rate. Okay. It's quite easy to understand where it is coming from. So again, I want don't I don't want to uh, overwhelm you with the calculation. I can come back to that later if you want, but basically to understand that. You need to look at the Navier-Stokes equation and to say that if the flow speed is very large, we can drop the viscosity in the bulk, and there is a force balance between the Lorentz force and the inertia. Okay, in some sense, the Lorentz force is replacing the gravitation in, in accretion disk. So we have this force balance. Now you need more assumptions. So basically, what you need to say is that the inertia is dominated by the Reynolds stress. We need to take the Reynolds stress here. Uh, what it means is that we are supposing that the bulk flow is as turbulent as possible, such that only the Reynolds stress appears in this force balance. And you can see that there is a logarithmic correction here, which comes from another assumption where we have also to suppose that the boundary layers in the system at the end caps became fully turbulent. If you do that, you get this prediction for the velocity field, which has no adjustable parameter. And as you can see, it can fit very well the velocity profile that we obtain in the experiment. So that's a very important point. In this experiment, we are generating a turbulent flow, as turbulent as possible, in fact, to get that. But the way it becomes turbulent has nothing to do with what is happening in an accretion disk. Okay, Here, it's due to the um, instability of the boundary layers, which become turbulent. 
And so the way we are becoming turbulent has nothing to do with accretion disk. In fact, we are trying to bypass this question because it's, as you may know, it's very hard to, uh, to, to get the MRI instability, which explain how disk became unstable. So we don't want, we want to bypass this question and to obtain the minimal ingredients for producing an accretion disk, which is a fully turbulent flow and a time average Kiplian profile. Okay, so in this regard, it's a very good model for accretion disk. Okay, so then we need to, so we can look, uh, for example, to power spectrum. You can see that it's very turbulent. So this is a power spectrum as a function of the wave number. So you have a K minus five third um, spectrum. We also computed the third order structure function in these experiments. And when you compute the third order structure function, you can see that the third order structure function are positive, which indicate that there is an inverse cascade of energy from the small scale of the experiment, which is the height of the, of the disk, to the large scale of the experiment, which is basically the horizontal gap between the two cylinders. So you have, so it's not any type of turbulence. We have here bidimensional turbulence with an inverse cascade of energy. Okay, so you really have to imagine that we have a fully turbulent disk, but which is invariant in the Z direction or quasi bidimensional as people say. So that's the second point, which is important in these experiments. Um, we want that, and that's basically why we're using a thin disk with a large current. We're using a thin disk because it is known in the MHD community that to make a bidimensional turbulence uh, with a liquid metal, you, you need uh, to have a, th a thin extension in the vertical direction and a strong magnetic field. So we're using a thin disk for that. And because we're using a strong magnetic field, the magnetic field has a tendency to make the flow laminar again. So we need to compensate that with a huge current to make it turbulent. That's the basic idea of the experiment. Okay. Um, so now we can come back to the comparison with the Taylor Quet flow. And so basically what I'm trying to show you is that we bypass the three different limitations that are generally encountered in uh, Taylor Quet flow. First, instead of a Quet profile, we are now able to generate a some Keplerian turbulence. So a Keplerian rotation rate in average, but associated with very strong turbulent fluctuations. The second thing is that we are not driving the angular momentum at the boundary anymore. We are driving it in volume with the Lorentz force. So it's a volume injection of angular momentum. And while in Taylor Quet flow, we have this problem with the end caps, which introduce some dependence in the Z direction here, we have a way to control this dependence by tuning the magnetic field. As we go to very large magnetic field, we can get two-dimensional turbulence, which strongly reduce this type of recirculation here. Okay. So for these three reasons, we can believe that now we can go back to studying the angular momentum transport and see what we can obtain with that. So right now, what I will do if some people here are working on a thermal convection, I'm following the same step than people are doing to compute the heat flux. So you may recognize the, the typical calculation that occurs in thermal convection. So basically we need an equation for the angular momentum flux. Uh, so you take Navier-Stokes equation, you, you uh, times the radius, you average it over time and over some cylindrical surface, uh, some cylindrical surface uh, at, uh, at a given radius and we obtain a very nice equation for the angular momentum. So basically what this equation says is that the time, the rate of production of angular momentum, which is created by the Lorentz force is, um, is balanced by a flux of angular momentum across this surface here. So there is a flux of angular momentum, just like there is a flux of heat in thermal convection. Now what we really want is to uh, quantify the efficiency of the flow to transport angular momentum. <clears throat> so I will define two different uh, dimension S number. The first one is the so-called Nusselt number. It is the angular momentum flux divided by its value if the flow were laminar. Okay, so you can 
you can compute the laminar solution in this, in this experiment. So we know exactly the form of the laminar transport of angular momentum, something very small, but it exists. And so what you want is to compare the angular momentum flux in the turbulent case here compared to what it would be if the flow was laminar. So it's exactly what's the same Nusselt number than in thermal convection. And you also want, so it's really a measure of the efficiency of the turbulence to transport angular momentum. You also want to, um, you also want to define uh, some magnitude for the turbulence. And for that, I introduce the Taylor number, which is nothing else here than a, a, a square Reynolds number. So I could have used a Reynolds number, by the way. It will change nothing on the following. But I use a Taylor number because when written like that, it's an exact analog to the Rayleigh number in convection. So just like in convection, we want to know the relation between the Nusselt and the Rayleigh. Here, we want to see if it's possible to get a scaling law for the Nusselt number, the efficiency of the turbulent transport, as a function of the, of the Taylor number of the turbulence. So there is a lot of work which have been done on this simple question. Here, I want to show you one of the simplest answers that people gave, which has been given by Kreknan in exactly 60 years ago, actually. So, um, Kreknan postulated that we can look for a relation between the Nusselt and the Taylor has a power law to some unknown exponent beta here. So, if I rewrite that, so this is the Nusselt here, I divided the flux and the laminar part. And this is the Taylor number to some power beta. Okay. Now, the idea of Kreknan is very simple. Kreknan say that if a flow is sufficiently turbulent, completely turbulent, as it is a, presumably the case in astrophysical objects, then at some point, the flux of angular momentum should become independent of the molecular diffusion. That's quite reasonable. If you're really turbulent, you feel like you may be able to forget about this term in the angular momentum flux. So it should become independent of nu. And you see the dimensional analysis tells you that you have nu here, nu square here. So if you want that to be independent of nu, you need beta to be one half. So it's a very simple prediction. Kreknan predicted that any turbulent system should at some point end up with this scaling. So Nussel scaling as the square root of the Taylor number. Unfortunately, it has not been observed in experiments. So if you look at the Taylor quet systems that have been used, previous experiments rather reported beta equal 0.38. So it's, it's, it's in fact a very important result. Huh? What it tells you is that in a Taylor quet flow, this is the best you can get. Why? Because the angular momentum is injected at the boundary. So you have some viscous boundary layer at the boundary of the of the cylinder. And these papers, these people here, showed that even if you're driving a very turbulent flow, the angular momentum has to depend on what's happening in these viscous boundary layers. So you can never forget about the viscosity in the fluid. And the ultimate regime is not reached. And you get something like that, which can be called an ultimate regime for Taylor quad flow. But it's not Kreknan's prediction. It's not. It is not what we would expect for a real system, an astrophysical system. So you see where I'm going here, because I uh, I bypass the uh, you know I skip the effect of the bond errors by injecting the angular momentum in volume. I can expect to have something different with these experiments. So we have done that. So we have measured the angular momentum flux by doing some local measurement of the velocity field. So at this point here, so it's roughly at mid plane, at mid um, yeah in the at mid radius of the experiment and also at mid height of the, of the experiment. So we can compute this guy and then uh, compute the Nusselt number. So this is the Nusselt number as a function of the Taylor number. As you can see immediately, if you look at the green points, which are the results obtained for a strong magnetic field, you can see that now we're getting much closer to Kreknan's prediction than before. Uh, the Kreknan prediction is, uh, um, is a pink uh, line here. And you can see that it fits very well the, uh, the green point here. Not, not 
perfectly, but there is a, a nice agreement. You can, so that's, that's the first point. By injecting the angular momentum in volume, we can get much closer to Kreknan's prediction. There is a second point to look at this picture. It's uh, if the magnetic field is smaller, like these two dots, the, the, the blue and the black uh, points here, you can see that there is a very strong departure from the uh, from Kreknan's prediction. It's it's a bit annoying because, of course, you want this regime is supposed to be a, a, a universal, and it seems to depend on the magnetic field here. But if you think about it, then you realize that it's what you would expect, because as I said in the introduction of the experiment, we have some polyhedral circulation. And right now we are doing some local measurements. So you see our local probe here is impacted by the local row circulation, by the inflow, which is crossing the probe. So this row circulation creates some additional measurements, which is not really, I mean, some additional value of the Nusselt number. When we increase the magnetic field, we go to two-dimensional two turbulence. The row circulations become much smaller, and then you can get closer to the, uh, to the, to the Kreknan's regime. Once you understand that, it's very easy to go beyond that. We can go back to the formula for the angular momentum and we can remove, just simply remove the uh, contribution from this row circulation. Okay, so here I'm removing the, the time average row circulation. And by doing that, we, have no, we now have a, a Nusselt number, which is really a measure of the transport achieved by the turbulent fluctuations in the bulk. And this is what we get. So as, we, as you can see now, so there are several things to see on this picture. First, you can look at the number. The Nusselt number now is two to, two, 10 to the power two, which is much smaller than what I was showing to you before with the row circulation, which is 10 to the power four. So first, what we're saying here is that locally, there is a huge transport of angular momentum by the, uh, by the row circulation. This transport would vanish if we were able to measure some torque because the torque would uh, cancel this contribution. It's a global measurement. Or you can do some local measurement by removing the, the time average part. And in this case, you can see that the transport is much smaller. And the second point, of course, which is of strong interest for us as a physicist, I mean, is that now we can show that the, uh, the Kreknan's regime is real. It exists. It can, here it's satisfied on, I don't know, two or more than two decades, actually. And it is independent now on, of the magnetic field. So that's interesting mm -hmm. because it shows that the Kreknan regime can be observed in experiments. It's not just, you can somehow uh, forget about the viscosity. So it opens new perspective for astrophysical objects, of course, because it means that we can apply this Kreknan's regime with some confidence to astrophysical objects. Um, it's also an interesting result because it helps understanding some controversy that appears a few years back between people doing global measurement of torque and local measurements in the mid plane. They found different Nusselt number. And here you can see why, because you can see that in some case you take into account the global circulation or not. So that's. Uh, so, uh, Christoph, uh, did you measure this Reynolds number? How do it depend upon Taylor number in this case? Um, on what what depend on the Reynolds number? The recirculation, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, not really. So we have we have we have a, a measure of the radial velocity as a function of the Reynolds number. It follows some uh, scaling, I think, if I remember correctly. The polyhedral circulation follows a similar, a similar scaling, like it's a square root of the Taylor number. I see. Okay. okay. So you can't really get rid of this recirculation by going at large Reynolds number. That's, that's the point. You can't get rid of that just by doing that, which is something that has been in the hair for some time. We People think that for that Kreknan is an ultimate regime. So at some point you should go at sufficiently large Reynolds number to drop all these polyhedral circulation. I think it's not so simple because it's always here. It has a similar scaling. So you really need to get rid of that with different boundary condition, for example. 
I see that. Okay, thank you. Uh, or right, think, uh, do some local measurements or some, some global torque, which will, which will cancel this contribution, of course. No, Christoph, I think uh, Pankaj is probably meaning to say that in uh, thermal convection, we report both Nussel as well as Reynolds number as a function oh, of Reynolds okay. number. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry, sorry. You mean the, the Reynolds wind? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the Reynolds wind is scaling like, so it's interesting, it's scaling like the square root of Taylor. I see. Which, okay. is, okay. which is up to a logarithmic uh, factor. Okay. It's the same than predicted by Craig Nam. Okay. But, he, but there is no logarithmic factor in our case, which have been explained by, uh, in this paper, in this paper, it has been explained that in rotational flows, contrary to what Craig Nam predicted, the mm -hmm. Reynolds screen should scale without a logarithmic scale uh, factor. Okay. And this is what we get here. Okay. All right. So, okay. So just to end this first part, I hope I'm not running too late. Um, once you get an ultimate regime, this is very convenient to do some prediction for astrophysical objects. Because what we're saying here is that we reached the ultimate regime. So there is no reason that it should change anymore. We can extrapolate our data up to the Reynolds number of astrophysical disks we should get the same answer because it is on the ultimate regime. So here I follow, I, I want DL to match this calculation. Uh, there is people before us who done, who done that with Taylor Quet flow. So basically, if you look at this paper, you can see that uh, the torque, the Nusselt number can be translated in some energy dissipation, which can be related to accretion rates, to some effective accretion rate for an accretion disk. So we can compute this effective accretion rate in our experiment as a function of the Reynolds number. This is what we get when we don't remove the polydolo circulation. And this is what we get without when we only consider the turbulent, the Keplerian turbulence. As you can see, with the global circulation, we get higher values, which are somehow close to the value that have been obtained with Taylor Quet flows, in which the recirculation is unavoidable. But when you remove that, you get a much smaller value, which is interesting. We believe it's a prediction for accretion rate. If you compare to the estimate from observations, it's the same value, it's the same order of magnitude than what has been observed for titori disk, so for real accretion disk. And so that's an interesting result, we believe, because it suggests that weak turbulence, as it is uh, generated here, may explain the accretion rate which are observed in accretion disk, which presumably uh, responds to some ultimate regime for the transport of angular momentum. Okay? Excuse me, Christophe. Uh, yes? That, uh, how, how, uh, in the previous slide, how, uh, the, 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 the curves at the bottom, how did you get them? So that's... You take the Nusselt number, so this is so. This is the classical Nusselt number. Uh, let's say this is the classical Nusselt number. Okay, when you want to calculate a corrected Nusselt number, a Nusselt number which drops the recirculation, you remove uh, this part here, so the, the time average part of the of the recirculation. Okay, so you get uh, some J star, some Nusselt star. Okay, and okay. I get the lower curve. Okay. By computing, instead of computing Nusselt divided by Taylor, I compute Nusselt star divided by Taylor. Okay, this is clear. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now it's time to me to switch for the second part. So um, again, I say that already, but again, it's not an MRI experiment. We're not trying to, the, the way the turbulence is generated here is very different from accretion disk. So that was the idea, huh? to, to get a turbulent flow and to study the angular momentum transport independently on the uh, origin of turbulence. But then this question remains, where does the turbulence come from? Okay. So I won't review all the possible scenarios to explain turbulence in astrophysics, but I'm showing you here one of the most appealing scenario. Right, it's a sketch of this scenario, basically. So. The idea is that in astrophysics, you always have some magnetic fields and shear flow. And you may expect that at some point, this magnetic field and this shear flow become unstable through some unknown instability. People believe that it could be MRI instability, other that it could be Teller instability, magnetic buoyancy, whatever. whatever. There is some instability 
which may generate turbulence in your system. Once you have turbulence, the turbulent motions of the fluid may be able to generate a dynamo and to generate a magnetic field, thus closing this loop. And so you may have a loop in which both the magnetic field and the turbulence are self-sustained in a, in a self in a, in a self-sustained process. So if you look in the literature, there is many systems which are believed to work on this very naive principle, very simple principle. Accretion disk, of course, but also some planetary interiors, some stellar interiors, even some tokamaks. They believe that in some tokamaks, you may have something like that. So in the last, in the remain, I don't know how much time I have, maybe I think 10 or don't worry, stop. You can go on when it's okay, let's say for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, maybe. Uh, take your time. I would like to show you now global simulation in which, so we forget about the, the accretion disk. We forget, we focus on the other example, which are radiative stars, but we will try to find such a scenario and then to study how the angular momentum is transported. So my interest now is uh, radiative stars. So what I mean by radiative. So you all know that in a star, in general, you have a convective region with thermal convection, very vigorous. Here, I'm interested in the other region of the star, which is the radiative region, which is more interesting because it's stably stratified. Uh, it seems less interesting, let's say, because it's stably stratified. So uh, there is no real source of turbulence. The so heat is transported by conduction and radiation. But as you will see, there is interesting question in this region here. Um, Basically, if you look observation, so there is recent progress from Astero and Heliosismology, who provide us rotation profiles of several stars. And it appears that these profiles are significantly flatter than what we would expect from simple uh, angular momentum conservation. I'm illustrating that roughly with this picture. So this is the angular rotation for the sun as a function of the radius. This is, uh, this is the radiative zone. The, the convection is around here. It's at larger radius. So we have the convection zone. And as you can see from this dot here, the rotation profile is very flat. It's solid body rotation, OK? It's very surprising because this is the curve you would expect if you take a star formation model and apply angular momentum conservation, OK? So somehow, there is a mechanism here, which is transporting angular momentum outside, so it flattens the rotation curve. Now, as I said just previously, there is this appealing scenario where people believe that the magnetic field could do the game, okay? For example, you see, if you had some magnetic field in your stellar evolution code, you get something much flatter, which fits much better the, the data. So we may have a magnetic field to, to do that. It's quite easy to understand. If you have a very strong magnetic field, you have some magnetic torque, which will apply some force on the, on the radiative stars, such that it uh, slow down, it spin down the, the inner part of the, of the star. But there is <laughs> several problems for, for this scenario. First, there is no turbulence. There is no turbulence in the radiative zone, and it's very hard to generate turbulence but because they are stably stratified region. Okay, the stratification prevents any nice and easy instability to trigger turbulence. But there is another problem, which is that when you look at the observations, there is some stars which have some flat rotation curves, so which are transporting angular momentum, but have no magnetic field. Okay, so again, it seems that the magnetic field may not be present everywhere, which uh, break this very nice scenario. So it's been a controversial uh, scenario, but for some reason, it's still one of the best explanation for the flattening of rotation curve of stars. So that was the motivation for the work I've done with Ludovic and Florence. So uh, we have a very simple model. So it's, uh, it's two concentric spheres. So it's a quite problem in spherical geometry. The inner sphere is rotating faster than the outer one by a factor delta omega. And between the two spheres, you have some electrically conducting fluid. And more important, it's stratified, so it's stable. So there is a stable temperature gradient in this Boussinesque equation. And we're using the parody code to do that. So 
I won't detail all the all the simulation we got. I want to focus on what is interesting today for, for this talk. So we just describe one typical simulation, I mean. So this is the velocity field we get, okay? So as I said, radiative zones are very quiet place. So if you do the purely hydrodynamical simulation, you get nothing. There is no turbulence, no convection. It's just some differential rotation between, so this is a meridional cut. So it's a differential rotation between a rapidly rotating uh, sphere and the outer sphere here, okay? So just some shear layer. If you run the simulation, this is what you get for some parameters for the magnetic energy. So you have some amplification of the magnetic field. It's not very interesting in the sense that um, it's saturated at a very low value. So this magnetic field is not able to produce some significant torque on the star. There is no spinning down of the star, no angular momentum transport, no turbulence, just a very laminar dynamo. It looks like that, the field looks like that. So now it's a cut in the equatorial plane. So as you can see, it's a toroidal magnetic field. So you, can, you have to imagine some torus of magnetic field which surrounds the inner sphere and which is nearly axisymmetrical, not completely, but nearly. This is your, your field. Now, from that, let's increase a little bit the conductivity of the star. If I do that, okay, you can see that now the field is a bit larger. The structure is still the same, nothing happened. But you can see now that I draw some dashed line here. This value is a very well known onset. It's the onset for the so called Taylor instability. What is that? We have a toroidal field, which is nearly axisymmetric. It is well known in astrophysics, but also in the plasma community, in the tokamak community, that uh, when you have a toroidal field like that, if the field is too, is too strong, it cannot keep its uh, stability, its coherence. So it will become non axisymmetric. It will start to destabilize. And as you, will, as you see, as I'm increasing the conductivity, I'm getting closer to this onset. Let's increase a little bit the conductivity. And you see now we have the orange curve. It starts the same, but then it crosses the stellar instability. The magnetic field becomes unstable, and something very surprising happens. The field, the magnetic field, nearly gains two orders of magnitude. So it becomes very strong suddenly. And so if you look at the velocity field, it becomes turbulent. Okay, so it's very surprising. We can look at this movie to understand what's going on. So here I'm showing you a typical simulation, the same simulation, the orange simulation. So this is a time series. This is the magnetic field from the top view. Okay, this is, and this is the velocity field. So as you can see at the beginning of the simulation, the magnetic field is axisymmetric. It's not unstable because we are here in the time series. So it has not reached again yet it's, uh, it has not reached yet its, uh, its critical onset for the, for the Taylor instability. And the flow is laminar. But let's start the simulation. Oops, spoilers. Um, let's start the simulation. So now, okay, we start the simulation. The magnetic field is amplified exponentially. You can look at this number. When this number is one, it means that we reach the onset for the Taylor instability. We are below, so it's stable. The flow is laminar. There is some structure here, but as you can see, it's a laminar flow. Nothing happening, but this is amplified exponentially. The value is increasing. Now we will reach right now the onset. And as you can see, now the magnetic field becomes unstable. This is well known. This is a Taylor instability. It becomes unstable. What is surprising now is that as it becomes unstable, there is some chaotic structures which are generated in the velocity field as well. As you can see now, the velocity field became turbulent in the inner part of the star. You can also see that in this, in this uh, meridional plane. You can see some small scale turbulent structures. Now, what is very interesting is that this turbulence, which is generated by the Taylor instability, is very efficient to regenerate, to amplify this initial axisymmetric magnetic field. So you have a dynamo loop, just like the one I was drawing before, in which the so Taylor instability trans creates some turbulence and the turbulence regenerates the magnetic field through dynamo action. And that's why very suddenly you get two orders of magnitude on the, on the magnetic field and you get some turbulence. 
Now, if I pause the simulation, you can look at the rotation profile inside this star. So the, the blue line is the initial profile before all this happened. Okay, so this is the initial profile. And as you can see, after this dynamo, you can see that the profile is much flatter than before. So we transported a lot of angular momentum during this process. Okay, so now we have a scenario to obtain turbulence, magnetic field, and huge angular momentum transport. So this is very similar to what was predicted uh, 20 years ago, which is called the Teller-Sprott dynamo. But somehow that's the first time that we are able to observe it in a simulation. And it's quite surprising. There are several things which are very different from what was predicted for the, for example, the turbulent structures are not the same. Um, the, the, the location of the instabilities in, is in the equatorial plane while it was predicted in the, at the polar region and so on. So there is some interesting surprises. Okay, so. So, so Christophe, yeah. So your stable stratified flow has become uns uns uh, unstable, is that correct? Uh, exactly, exactly. That's what I'm showing you right here, actually. We have a stably stratified flow. It is supposed to be stable. But what we have, if you want to say it in a more physicist way of speaking, what we have is subcritical transition to turbulence in a stably stratified flow. That's all this is about. Okay. This can be illustrated by this bifurcation diagram. So this is a magnetic energy, but it could be also the turbulence as a function of the differential rotation in the star. When you start the simulation, you have all these points which are at zero because you have zero turbulence, zero magnetic field, because as you said, it's a stably stratified region. But the star, let's say, accelerates, okay, during its life, and then it reaches some critical value when the movie I just showed you happens. It triggers turbulence and it triggers magnetic field through a subcritical transition. So because there is this self-sustainment between turbulence and magnetic field, this branch is strongly subcritical. So once you're here, there is a strong subcritical dynamo, there is a magnetic torque. So there is some angular momentum transport and the start start to flatten the rotation profile. So the differential rotation decreases. So we move along this line, but because it's a subcritical transition, we don't go to zero. We remain on a non-zero turbulent state. And you can arrive here where, as you said, you have turbulence magnetic field in a region which is stably stratified. So it's a way to get turbulence in stably stratified regions. Okay. Okay, so I'm almost at the end. So once you understand that, then now, of course, so for those of you who know MRI, this scenario is very close to the MRI dynamo scenario. It's the same thing, except that the Teller instability plays the role of the MRI instability. But it's something that might be quite general in astrophysics or at least the, 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 the big lines. Now, once we have that, because there is a flattening of the rotation curve, it's uh, very interesting to compute the angular momentum. So we can do some prediction. So if you remember what I said in the first part of the talk, we are, these simulations are operating at large Reynolds number, large RM, large stratification. So we expect the molecular diffusion to be, uh, to be non-important. So here I postulate I expect to have an ultimate transport, some Craig Nan regime. The thing are a bit different from my experiments because now it's a rapidly rotating star. So the Lorentz force is in balance with the Coriolis force. So it's a magnetostrophic force balance. That's the second very important point in our experiments, in our simulation, sorry. And the third point is that, of course, what is doing the job is the Teller instability. So you want the typical length scale of your problem to be, to be the Teller instability length scale, which is well known in the literature. If you combine these three assumptions, it completely constrains the problem from the dimensional analysis point of view. And then you have only one answer possible for the torque, for the Nusselt number, if you prefer, which is this one here. So this is the magnetic torque, the magnetic stress, which is applied to the star. And it depends on the velocity, the rotation, and the stratification of the star in this way here. And as you can see, this theory is fit explaining very well our simulation. These all points here are different simulations with different numbers. And as you can see, they are all fitted very well 
by this theoretical prediction. Okay. I have to make some tribute to, uh, to Sprott here because so at first we found a difference. This is not the exact same formula than Sprout uh, derived in 2002. So we first thought that we found a new scaling, but in fact, we discovered that there is some, there is some scaling in which you can go continuously from this expression to the one uh, predicted by Sprout. So, so I think what we really have here is a prediction made by Sprout 20 years ago, uh, which is a good thing because it can uh, explain for the most part, the flattening, the, the angular momentum, the spinning down of radiative stars. Um, and I will finish with just one thing. So if you remember in the introduction of this part, I said that there is some stars that has no magnetic field. So there is some doubt on the teller sprout scenario. If you have no magnetic field, you can't have this very nice magnetostrophic scenario. But we discovered that in our simulations, in fact, this is the turbulence, you can see that in yellow, and the blue stuff is the magnetic field. The magnetic field we have is a toroidal magnetic field, and it's, it's located deep inside the radiative region. So when we take our simulation and we measure the field outside the star, we get almost nothing. So we have a dynamo, we have the Teller-Sprott or some kind of Teller-Sprott dynamo, but it's completely hidden from outside. So that this may explain why we can find uh, uh, spinning down stars with, with no apparent magnetic field. So, so this, is, this is more or less the title of our, of, our, of, our, um, of our paper, that hidden dynamo spin down radiative stars. Okay, so, so you see for this part, I was interested in the subcritical, we were in the, interested in subcritical transition to turbulence. So we know where the turbulence is coming from. And then we can compute the uh, angular momentum transport and see that it can explain the observations. While in the first experiment, of course, the Reynolds number in this simulation are very restricted to small values. If you want to go beyond that, you need to do experiments. So if you now look at the laboratory experiment of the accretion disk, we can get at much higher ultimate regime, much higher uh, turbulent flow but we have to bypass the, create the generation of turbulence. So we have to generate the turbulence in another way. But at the end, we get a nice model, I think, for accretion disk, at least for the angular momentum transport. Um, thank you very much. Thank Christophe for excellent talk. OK, so we can take questions now. Uh... Yes, maybe I can start. This is Frank. Yeah. Yes. So thank you, Christophe, for these uh, two talks in one. Thank you very much. Hey, well, sorry, I hope it was not No, 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 this is very rich. So I have a, a small question about the second part, the numerical part. Yeah. When you, so if, if, I, if I understand well, you varied the magnetic parental number from yeah. one yeah. simulation to the other. Yeah. And uh, yes, and, and so I was wondering, um, uh, because, at small magnetic printal number, the magnetic uh, field is uh, at a larger scale than the, the velocity field. And so when you increase the magnetic printal number, step by step, you, you, you have a smaller and smaller scales of the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, is it related to? Um, so in fact, uh, we haven't, so, for these values, so I have to say that we focus on the PM equal one simulation, which is this one here. Um, so we haven't, for example, we haven't explored too much the small PM value. As far as I can tell, there is no significant difference in the small scales. So at least for this range here, I don't see much difference in that. And, uh, but, but PM is quite, so RM is quite large which means that, of course, that's how we get a scenario which is maybe a bit different one from what was Prout was predicting because, because RM is very large, we will generate small scale structures in the magnetic field. And this, it probably helps to, um, to, to generate some turbulence in the flow, some small scale turbulence in the flow. So I would say it's more a question of RM in our case. I haven't seen too much difference with PM. Okay, um, but so, so it means it, it is uh, you you confirm that it is uh, related maybe to the apparition 
of the small scale of the magnetic field. Yes, yes. In fact, okay. you see, so if you look at the paper of, so one reason why Teller Sprout Dynamo was criticized, it's because in the original paper, uh, it's not completely clear, but at least the interpretation of the of the of this paper was by several people that um, that the Teller instability should create an m equal one mode. Okay, and then in this loop, uh, well, so this was supposed to create some m equal one mode. And the m equal one mode was then supposed to regenerate the m equal zero mode, which is a bit problem because from the symmetry point of view, you have an m equal one mode and you are asking it to regenerate an m equal zero mode. It was not completely clear. So, so it had been criticized by Zan, for example, who said that this type of symmetry doesn't work. So here we, you see, we solve in some sense this problem because, because the RM is very large, you can see that. What's happening is that we don't have really an m equal one mode here. It's a very small scale destabilization of the magnetic field. And this, this is probably, so then you have a small scale destabilization of the velocity field. And so you have mean field effects to regenerate the axisymmetric field. And so then in this case, the loop can, be, can work, you see? And this is due to RM. So yes, so the small scale structure of the magnetic field are very important. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, maybe I'll ask. Hi, sir. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, Harshit. Yes, sir, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in the accretion disk laboratory experiment, so how did you guys rotate the fluid? So can you explain that? So, it, say it again. So, how did, the, uh, how did you rotate the fluid inside the laboratory experiment? How did I rotate it? Yeah. You in the accretion disk uh, experiment, yeah. Yes. So we're not rotating the boundaries. Yeah, you rotated it using a current, right? Yeah. Yes, Different. yes. Yes, so you see, uh, so you can see that the boundaries are not rotating. So so it's, it's liquid so gallium. Is the, is the liquid uh, gallium charge? Yes, yes, so it's a liquid gallium. So you see what's happening is that there is three thousand, so not on this uh, movie, and this movie it's maybe 10 amps or something like that, but so there is a few amps crossing from this. You can see here the wires. So we're bringing some currents. It's going through here and here below the experiment, there is some wire going back. So we're getting the electrical current like that. And it is placed in a Helmholtz coil. So you have the vertical magnetic field. So it's really the volume Lorentz force which drives the flow in this direction. Okay, so it's homogeneous. So the, the radial current is homogeneous. The, uh, I mean, it's not, yeah, you can see here. So this is the form of the Lorentz force. So you have the total current is divided by the, you know, the section of the, the cylindrical section. So the force is one over R, okay? The magnetic field is homogeneous. So there is no problem here. So you have a force which is like that. And so you drive the flow uh, really with uh, electromagnetically, with an electromagnetic force, in fact. So it's like a metal uh, shit. So yeah. there is a free current that supports it's, the it's a, it's, Yeah, it's an electronic pump, basically. We're pump, pumping the fluid like that in the azimuthal direction. Yes. Okay. okay. There's one more question where we should. Okay, thanks. Great, very good. Okay. Avishek, please unmute and ask. Yeah, uh, so am, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a very nice talk. Uh, so the, in this same experiment, uh, you, you said that when the magnetic field is increased, the secondary flow becomes very small. Uh, but if I look at the form of the J cross B with increasing magnetic field, there is stronger swirled force. So with a stronger swirled force, the secondary flow would be expected to become stronger, larger. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So in fact, to be more precise, uh, let's say, I don't know, here maybe. So more precisely, when you have a thin disk like that and you have some recirculation and that you apply a strong magnetic field, what's happening is that this part of the recirculation, the part which is close to the end caps, will circulate in thinner and thinner boundary layers, okay? Because you're thinnering the Hartmann layers. And so what's happening is that it's not, the magnitude is, is not what is important here. What's happening is that the, the, the inward, no, the, sorry, the outward here, flow will be uh, 
uh, it, 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 it should be the other way around. But so the inward flow will be very thin. And so it recirculates on a more broad uh, distribution here. So that's why it's, it decreases a little bit this part. But as you can see, if I really remove the radial flow, you, I go from 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 2. So even at strong magnetic field, my local measurement still see a very strong radial flow. Okay, so I'm not suppressing mm -hmm. it. I'm inhibiting a little bit. I'm reducing it. I'm reducing this circulation, but I'm not suppressing it. You're completely right. There is still a very strong, a very strong, uh, a very strong uh, recirculation. But for the angular momentum, you have to remember that if you integrate over the whole cylinder, the full cylinder, this contribution will not uh, contribute to the angular momentum transport. So if I was able to measure, to do torque measurement, mm -hmm. okay, on the full cylinder, I will immediately get this Nusselt number. And the Nusselt number will be the dimensionless torque, more or less, and I will get this number. Okay, it's really because I get local measurement that I get large values. And even a strong magnetic field, as you said, I still get some circulation here. Um, okay. My point here is that if you look at the literature, people have been doing torque measurements in Taylor Quet flows, but they, uh, they separated the torque measurement from the end caps. So the torque was only measuring the torque in the central region. Mm -hmm. And what it's suggesting here is that it may not be a good idea because then you see, you will measure that. You will measure this local transport of angular momentum due to the recycle. Right. So if you want to do torque measurement, you need to do all the way along on the full, uh, on the full um, setup. Right, so it's a global, essentially a global picture of exactly. angular momentum transport rather than local. Okay. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thanks. Yes, oh. and, and you, you uh, if, if I am right, you, you reached uh, uh, electric currents up to 3000 uh, ampere. But in fact, you, you limited uh, in the slides you, you showed us, uh, did, did you use this, uh, this uh, amount of, of electric current or? Yeah, I, I yeah. Uh, so here, for example, so it's in low, low, so I think the last point here, so let's see. Uh, so it's 100, so it's, yeah, it's 100 millitesla basically. And the product of the two is 100. So it means that it's 1000 amps here. But 3,000 will be here, you see. OK. So I haven't put it here because so it's... did you did you have a my, my question is, did you have advantage to use a very strong electric current up to 3,000? Yes, because you see what I want. So I have three regimes in the experiments. The first regime is this. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it's this one, the so black. And you see, it's, it's not doing the same scaling. It's a laminar. It's a it's a well known uh, it's a well known uh, regime in this type of in this type of setup. It's when you have a laminar uh, balance between the Lorentz force and the and the viscosity here. So it's somehow the laminar solution. I want to I want to I don't I want to avoid that. There is also another regime which is around here. So if I want to reach Keplerian turbulence, I want to be in this part okay. of the. So you and, see, and, so what's happening is that if I wanted to reach, so I want to reach IB equal, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say 100. So if I want to, to reach IB equal 100, um, I don't want to do that with a very strong magnetic field because if you look at the experiments of Alban Potera, for example, or even Someria, you can see that when they use very strong current, like one Tesla in magnetic field, you'd laminize the flow. And so you don't get this Kepler. That's why people have not been observing this Kepler profile before. Huh? It's because most of the experiments were uh, running low current, like 100 amps, but one Tesla in magnetic field. So the forcing okay. was the same, but it was it was it was bringing the system in a very strongly laminarized uh, flow. So that's why I, I so I have to if I want to reach 100 millitesla, which is quite necessary, you see, because. That's really what is interesting for me. I, I need to compensate it with very yes. large. Current. So, for example, in for this to obtain this uh, these results, you use the uh, 
Which oh, so do you remember which uh, intensity you use so for I the current? Think, yeah, so it's it's varying. So the Taylor number is uh, evolving is a function of the current, and that's how I ah, yes, okay. the Taylor number. So okay. I think this point might be one thousand amps. Okay. In general, so in general, we haven't put the 3000 in general, if I remember correctly, just because at 3000 amps, it's uh, the experiment is eating a lot. And so you can do measurements for maybe a few uh, 30 seconds, not more. And so in general, it's more noisy. So we don't, we don't, okay. uh, we don't go too much higher, but this is probably 1000 amps. Okay. You see, okay, thank you. 3000 will be here. It will be not too far, in fact. Okay. okay, so I have a couple of questions, uh, Christoph. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the mag in the sun, our sun, uh, you expect magnetic field in the radiative zone? I mean, people normally say there's no magnetic field in the radiative zone. So the sun is a bit particular. So okay. yes, so the, here I was using the sun more as a, as a rough illustration, as I said, for the transport of angular momentum. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it was just for this picture here, uh, okay. but you're right. Yeah, the sun, uh, it's, it's not completely clear. So people think that you can still have some, some Taylor Sprout dynamo in the sun. So they expect some magnetic field, but it's very hard to, it's very hard to measure. Huh? We, we can't have free access. So there is very recent results, not for the sun, I think. I, I'm not completely sure, but I think it's not for the sun. It's for some other radiative star where they're using asteroseismology to deduce some value of the magnetic field inside the star. But I think it's very tricky. So, so, so I have to answer for that. So the first thing is that for the sun, it's quite different. Even if people believe that they, they can still have some magnetic field. But, uh, but most of the talk concerns um, intermediate mass and massive uh, stars. I see. Much stars. You see, uh, do I have a picture like that? So you see, uh, most so in the sun it's not first you have a convective uh, region so you can you can transport the angular momentum through the convection but there is some stars which are, which are fully radiative for example right, right. don't have convection so here you really need some powerful mechanism to transport the angular momentum because you can't rely on convection I and see. that this type of uh, stars which are interesting us i see okay the second question is a bit uh, okay so in your experiment you know, so you are producing angular momentum by the J cross B force, right? Uh, that's what he said. There mm -hmm. are, but if I make an analogy with uh, Rayleigh Bernard, mm -hmm. then that would correspond to heating in the volume, right? Uh, there are places where I am heating the fluid. Yes, completely. Right. So yeah. then the Nusselt number is not uh, the model of Kretnen is that you're heating from the bottom and pulling from the top. There's oh, no yeah, heat yeah. in the source in the in between. Now, if you put the source in between, then there's a variable uh, energy source or variable, uh, no, variable angular momentum source or variable heat flux source. So doesn't your scaling get affected? I mean, Cretan formula needs some modification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there is a logarithmic correction, in fact, that I, so for the sake of the simplicity of the talk, I was dropping that. But this is the real, this is the real, um, this is a real prediction you have. We are quite, so it could have been, so that's, that's a good question. It okay. could have been, we could have been looking for an ultimate regime and okay. it's a little bit by chance that okay. the power law is the same than Craig Nan. So it's good, it's good for uh, pedagogical uh, reasons, but it's a coincidence. In fact, the full correct calculation is like that. So your Nusselt number should be depend on the Taylor number, okay. but you also have another dimensionless number, which is your, uh, your internal heating, if it was thermal convection, which in our case is the uh, Lorentz force. I see. Okay. So it's a more complicated problem. Okay. But when you suppose, like Kreknan, that the transport is independent of the molecular viscosity, I you see. have some relation between alpha and beta. I see. And if you have Keplerian turbulence, you have another relation between Taylor and this number M. And okay. when, you, when you combine them, you get that. I see. Okay. You see? But this is for the full, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's my that's my answer. Okay, so if there is some logarithmic correction if you do the the calculation properly, yes. But I drop it because it's okay, it's very small. So you can you can think of that uh, just by thinking about the uh, the Nusselt right. number. So <clears> that is uh, going down with the 
okay there is a okay oh, great all right okay thanks so uh, we had a very many questions so thanks Istra, for a very nice talk thank you very much and, uh, thank you thank you for the invitation and yes. for the nice discussion great okay and uh, again thanks to all of you for attending it making it successful thanks to the organizing committee rupak you can send the question to uh, christopher huh? sure uh, christopher you can take a question from rupak there's one uh, one audience has a question i can take the question yes if you want yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, rupak, it's just a very simple thing so uh, you showed that you have some sort of a friction at the uh, at the two boundaries right yeah, so yes, this is this is not a, a free sleep condition. No, no, it's not a free sleep boundary conditions. That's the main problem with this experiment. So if you want to go beyond that, you want uh, you want to find a clever way to suppress this friction. So is it possible that you rotate the boundaries at the same velocity? Ah, so you, you're talking about the radial boundaries at this point, yeah. or the end caps. So it's complicated. So we might manage to do something like that. So I'm more concerned about the friction at the end caps, because if the aspect ratio of my disk is so large that frankly, the friction at the boundaries, in addition with the volume injection of angular momentum should not place too much role, but the friction at the end caps are a problem. Hmm. So we might, we might, so I, I've been suggesting shown like that to rotate the cylinders, but it's very hard because we want to pass 3000 amps. So you, we won't be able to pass 3000 amps with, with rotating cylinders. So why am I uh, interested in this? Because you connected it up with the tokamaks. Yeah. Uh, in one of your slides, uh, you wrote yeah. that it has yeah. applications in tokamaks. In tokamaks, the plasma uh, in the out, both in the inner and outer region do not actually touch the vessel. So they yeah, are all yeah. hold within magnetic fields. That's true. So yeah, they, they actually enjoy a free sleep, effectively free sleep boundary in both the uh, both the radially radial ends. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, what you can do though, it's something that we are building right now. Um, okay. uh, so there is a way to reduce. So you can you can do, for example, a free surface. At the top of the of the gallium, and so in okay. this way you reduce the friction. For example, hmm. there is some other ways that we are discussing right now to reduce the friction on the other boundaries. But uh, it's quite uh, so that will be something that you can do. But for the radial boundaries, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard. You, you could imagine hmm. some stuff. I we thought about that a little bit, putting some rotating boundaries after the radial injection of current. But it's I it, I feel like it's gonna be very very complicated. Okay. No. Okay. Great. Any your experiment is a very good anyway. Uh, mm, of course. <laughs> Thank Great. you very much. Great. All right. Okay. Thanks again uh, to Christoph and others. Okay. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Bye bye, Christoph. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.